It's December, last month of the year, so we got a final market update for this year. And I'm excited because I'm back alive after getting murdered brutally last night in a murder mystery dinner. So I'm here in the flesh, ready to rock and roll with our market update with my colleague Lee Abraham. On today's video, we're gonna cover clickbait headlines that are breeding fear and anxiety. I'm gonna share some inspiring stories of our clients out there making deals over the past week and what that says about the market and three critical takeaways that could potentially impact your real estate journey. So let's start by diving into the stats and we'll get to the rest of that here shortly. So David, we always start out with looking at the number of active listings at the beginning of the month. And in spite of the headlines, in spite of the media's portrayal of the market that we're in, the actual number of listings for sale at the beginning of the month is less than the previous month. 2,232 active listings of single family homes in the city of Austin. It's a contrary indicator to a market that's moving towards a buyer's market. So let's break it down. Here we got the monthly housing inventory, and you can see that we have a one month housing inventory of 4.9 months. And just to give you some context here, here's what it's been over the last year. So we get, we're already going back a full year here. Yeah. And, and so you can see it's slightly down from last month and we see some moderation here. We've been in this four to five month range for the previous three months. You know, when we get to the supply barometer here, you'll see that looks like for the time being, we're going to stick in this range. Of course, it's going to be a whole new ball game next month. New year. People are going to have new goals for the year. There's yeah. going to be a lot going on. So uh, we'll be very curious to see what happens. And of course, there's the macroeconomic environment that's going to be a big part of what happens next year. So not only that, we're going through the holidays, which always uh, creates a little mayhem mm -hmm. in the market. So um, we'll see how the numbers play. A little play mayhem. Out. Mayhem. Yeah. What kind of mayhem we got? Seasonal shopping, David. We'll talk a little bit more about the opportunities out there as we cross over into 2023. Yeah. So here we got the number of sales. So down to 456 sales last month. Wow. Uh, if you look across this chart, that is actually the lowest right. number of sales out of any month right. since 2017 that we're showing here. Right. So that's pretty crazy. And it's down 50% from last year this time and down 20% from last month. So, you know, what we'll talk about, this is actually, from what I remember, the first time that we've actually seen a more than 50% reduction in yeah. the number of transactions. So up until now, it's always been that the majority of deals are still happening. So it felt like, oh my gosh, the market's imploding. Well, we were down 20 or then 35% right. on the number of transactions. So when you're down 35%, you still have the majority of transactions, 65% of them are still happening. Right. This is the first time. Now we have only 45%, so less than the majority of these transactions are now happening. Yeah, and I think the key thing from a fundamental standpoint is that the number of sales per month is a more nimble metric as opposed to the supply side. Much easier for a buyer who's sitting on the sideline to jump in and get active um, than supply coming to the market. So when we look at housing inventory, the interaction between what's available, how many are selling per month, to me, this is a good fundamental indicator of the strength of our market um, because the numbers are just so low on the demand side, they've got to go up. Mm -hmm. And this is a lagging indicator Correct. because this is what has closed. Right. It usually takes 30 to 60 days for a deal to close. Right. So what we're going to talk about with our anecdotes are all happening in the last week, right. maybe two. And so they're not even counted into these numbers yet. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Right. Talk about average price. So it is actually up year over year still. So we still have not seen a year over year price decline. Correct. Even though we're down from the highs earlier this year, down month over month. But this is just the month over month stuff is probably just normal seasonality. Yes. <clears throat> if you look at previous years, you know, 2021 was an exception, it looks like. But most years it's down from October to November. So that's not that abnormal. Yeah, and just to forecast um, into the first quarter of next year, we may see a year-over-year -year drop. Um, we're not looking for something that would be statistically significant, but it's noteworthy. And I think that the holiday volatility and some of the other macros, we may actually see a slight decrease year-over-year -year in the first quarter. We'll okay. see. Yeah, we'll report it if it happens. Correct. So here we're looking at days to sell. Um, clearly a dramatic 130% increase year over year, a um, little over 21% month to month. And sure, 
it's a big increase, but still you're at 46 days. That's healthy. Um, I don't see any cause for concern there. Yeah, and the reason that we show back five years here is so you can see that 2017 and 2018, this is where we were. Yeah. So this isn't anything abnormal. Correct. Context is the key in analyzing long-term statistics. We frequently talk about recency bias. Hey, if you are most familiar, if your experience has been in the most historically strong seller's market, everything else looks like a crisis. <laughs> so, but that's not what we're seeing. This kind of gets into what builders and professionals yes. are seeing. Yes. You know, the, we have two different people out there selling right now. You have what I call professionals, which right. is builders, maybe they're real estate investors. They have a good handle on the market and they tend to have more inventory. Meaning they don't just have their one home, which mm -hmm. brings us to the other side of the market, mm -hmm. which is mostly resales, which is owner occupants. And they might only have one home. And if their home was worth a million and a half six months ago, now they're looking at only getting 1.3 million. Well, they may just want to hold on, right? They're not, you know, it's this recency bias, this price anchoring, and they're like, I'm not selling for less, even though potentially there's another side of the equation. And we'll talk about that. So we have these two parties. And we've seen that homeowners are less likely to want to lower their price, right. whereas builders and other professionals, they have inventory that they need to move and they're willing to negotiate. And so we've had two deals here in the past week, both of which were new construction, which we were to get able to get those properties for under list price, for under a price that they would have sold for just even a couple of months ago, one of which... We even got it for less than it would have sold for a month ago. Mm -hmm. And we could see that because of the dynamics of it being in, uh, there being a matching unit nearby that sold just a month ago. Mm -hmm. We know the price on that. So these buyers are getting a great deal. Now, I had a conversation this morning with one of those buyers. Well, they saw the news, you know, the fear headlines and like it was a $69 billion fund with a BlackRock was having all time high redemption. So people are trying to get their money out of the fund. Well, to me, that's just a sign of fear, right? People right. are afraid. The fund's performance actually has outpaced the S&P 500. So these people are better off having their money in there, but they're afraid. And when I hear that, I think, wow, okay, another signal that it's time to buy. Let's just keep it simple. Buy on fear. <laughs> yeah. And so a conversation with this buyer went along like, well, I'm afraid that the market's going to go down further. I said, that's probably going to happen. The chances that... Today, when you went under contract, was the exact bottom of the market and we nailed it because it's still going down. That's for sure, right? We're buying it for less than we would have sold, bought for a month ago. Okay, so the chance that we nailed the bottom today is less than 1%, I would say. So the, the likelihood... Okay, you're, you're giving me a nod, like maybe it's more than one. Yeah, maybe. Well, I mean, it's an abstract conclusion. 1%, yeah. 10%, 50%, I mean, you know. All right, well, whatever. Speculation. It's... it's it's a low percentage chance yes. that we nailed the bottom of the market. Right. Okay. Yeah. So likely the price is going to go down before it goes up. Right. And we don't care about that. Right. Like if we're trying to time the market and nail it perfectly, you're going to lose every time. So, well, every time is 99% of it. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is buy somewhere along the way down yeah. or on the long, long on the way up. Right. But really the conversation is, do you feel how long are you going to live in this house? Okay. You're going to live here at least three years. How do we feel about the value of this home in three years compared to the price you're buying it at today? Well, we're already buying it for 20% less than the all time high. Okay. So I feel like that's a good um, measure. Mm -hmm. Could we be back at all time highs in three years when, when you're at this point where you might want to move? Yeah. I think that's totally reasonable. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So there's a ton of upside for this person whether or not they're nailing the bottom of the market. And so this is a really tough thing. And that's why if you've watched any of our videos, I'm hammering these points home because sometimes people need to hear these things three or four or maybe more times before it really sinks in. So I'm trying to coach you through this, people. <laughs> yeah, and it's not just the macro market that the uh, our client, the buyer, is operating in. They're dealing with one specific seller. And whether it's a professional seller, a builder, or a homeowner, and it's their one real estate asset, it's all about timing. It's all about negotiation strategy, much more so than buying stock at the top or the bottom of the market. Yeah. That's a really key point for folks. Yeah. And I, so I think the keys that takeaways, two of the three takeaways here, one, 
Higher interest rates means it's a time to buy, yeah. right? People are afraid. There's a lot of these headlines out there. It means you can get a better deal. You can get a property that you wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. And that's the key. And as we've mentioned, some of our friends in the mortgage industry have a phrase that, you know, ties into this concept, which is, you know, marry the real estate and date the rate. So getting the property that's ideal for your lifestyle, the amenities, is really how you win. Um, and that's the number one variable. Yeah. And so this property where we were the only buyer and we got it for under asking six months ago, there would have been 10 other buyers lined up. We would have had to go over asking. The terms would have been totally different, mm -hmm. right? The terms that we're getting for our buyers, it's like crazy. It's like a whole, it feels surreal sometimes that it's like, wait, I'm getting to put a for sale of other property contingency on what? That would have been unheard of six months ago. Appraisal waiver, those even aren't even part of the conversation. Right. And six months ago, that was an automatic on there. Mm -hmm. So the terms are so much better for buyers. If you were one of these people that were like, well, I'm going to wait, you know, this is the time. Like, you know, maybe in the spring will be better. I don't know. It could be worse. We, we just, it's really hard to tell. Um, but it's definitely good now. Right now we have all the things that we have going on plus seasonality. Right. The spring, the seasonality goes against buyers right. and it's for sellers. Right. So if you're a seller, probably makes sense to wait until the spring and hopefully things turn around for you. Right. But we don't know which way it's going to go. When it comes to higher interest rates and fear being the time to buy, we have another video. So mm -hmm. make sure to go down in the description and check it out, which we actually run you through the numbers and give you scenarios. And we have a spreadsheet. If you comment on that video spreadsheet, then we'll go ahead and send it to you. And you can play around with the numbers yourself. The second takeaway here is the fundamentals of Austin. So remember, when you see these headlines of fear, these are nationwide things that right. are happening very often. And here in Austin, prices are still up like we just showed you. Like We have not seen year-over-year -year declines. Demand is down, which leaves a lot of opportunity for the market to skyrocket yep. back up really quickly. And we actually don't have that much inventory. Five months sounds like a lot, but... When the sale, when demand has dropped so much, it increases that number a little bit artificially. Right. I want to show you, this is a nationwide stat, but I think it gets the point home. This is the percentage of our housing stock that is currently available for sale. So this is different than inventory, which is based on supply and demand. This is This chart that I'm showing you now is based on the number of homes that are actually in the United States and the percentage that are available for sale. And if you look back, you can see what 2006 looked like, seven, during the housing crash and the great financial crisis, okay? They were, it was up there in like the 4% range. And you can see over the last 12 years, it has declined and it was down to as low as 1.8%. And now we're not even up to 2%. So we are half of what the housing inventory right, based on the housing stock was in the crash of mm -hmm. 2008. Yes. So there's really just not that many homes that are being listed right now in comparison. Well, while we're looking at charts, let's take a look at this one, which shows homeowner equity versus yeah. the unemployment rate. Yeah. And so what you'll see in blue here is the unemployment rate. And right. it says owner, so I'm guessing this is of homeowners specifically. Right. And you can see what happened in the 2008 crisis. Unemployment went up. Equity was going down. And we had a huge issue. Well, where are we today? Equity is at, at basically all-time highs. And unemployment yeah. is at an all-time low. Yeah. So people thinking that we're going to see some 2008-style crash, like, I don't see how that's possible. Now, could these, num could these lines stay intersect at some point? We're a far ways away from right. that. We'd have to have a lot of stuff go awry for that to happen. Yeah. I think we're in a pretty strong fundamental situation yeah. for things to not get off the rails like 2008. Right. You know, I remember sitting across the kitchen table from sellers um, back during the Great Recession, people who were underwater, people who um, had lost their life savings, um, ugly, painful, nasty situations. Uh, we look at the current market, you read the clickbait headlines, crash, those type of images being portrayed. It's a different scenario now. People are just going to make less money than they would have otherwise made rather than losing their life savings because they have to sell. That's a big difference. And to be honest with you, it's very frustrating 
to be inundated by the media that can't accurately portray the difference of what's happening today versus a real, uh, I'm going to say, a real crisis for most people. And so anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah, and the, I think the frustrating part for me is that everybody that reads just the headlines right. and gets afraid and then makes, you know, I want to say you want to say poor financial decisions or poor real estate decisions, but they definitely don't make good ones because they're like, well, uh, it's not a good time to buy. Look, the market's going to totally, you know, collapse, but that's not the case. So that's why we're trying to bring the proper data to you, hopefully the proper way to think about this so that you can make an educated, informed decision for yourself. Absolutely. So here we have the number of new listings, which are down 22% from last year and down 34% from last month. Here's where I'm saying that people would rather just take their helm off the market than to sell it for less than they thought it was worth. Yes. And this, they're fine to do that because they have a really low interest rate. They've got a job. Like the fundamentals are there so they can do that. This isn't a 2008 where people are losing their jobs and they don't have enough equity. They're just going to wait it out. And that's totally fine. Yeah. And um, as we move closer towards um, our grand finale here on this uh, video, we're going to talk a little bit about how this actually creates a great opportunity for buyers with the declining number of new listings being brought to the market. So uh, we'll share that in just a moment. Here we have expired listings. So this is when the end of a listing agreement between a seller and a listing agent, the agreement expires. And so the listing expires and it comes off the MLS automatically and we get the number of expired listings. So you can see from last year, we have more expired listings, which makes sense. A little bit odd that they're down from last month. We're not going to look that much into it because it's just one month and you know, I think the fundamentals of this market, what we've been talking about, the numbers here for expired listings aren't anything too crazy that would would say anything to the contrary of what we're seeing everywhere else. Exactly. So yeah, our old buddy, the closed price, list price ratio, it's a voodoo kind of number. Depends on where the list price starts at. You know, David, we just closed escrow um, representing a buyer. Property was originally listed for $489,000. Um, we were looking for properties that uh, met their lifestyle criteria. Clearly this property did that, but one of the things that attracted us as the buyer's agent was the series of price reductions that the listing agent had, um, you know, used to market the property. And so, um, long story short, we wound up making an offer of 395, not knowing how low the seller would go and uh, reached an agreement at 400000 That's a huge drop from the original list price to the closed price. And so when you see these type of numbers, that doesn't mean that you're only going to get a 4% discount off the list price. There's a lot that goes into this particular stat. It's showing us that the numbers are slightly down, just an indicator of softening demand. We know that's the case. Nothing to be afraid of here. We'll leave by my math. Uh, yours was an 82 percenter. Discount. Dis well, 18% discount, 82%. 82%. Yeah. Close price to list price ratio. Yes. I got one that was $450,000 off the list price that we just closed escrow on. Oh, Nelly. <laughs> um, that one was a commercial deal. Yeah. And although you do actually have me beat on the percentage because ours was only an 84%. You don't put percentages in the bank, David. It's dollars. <laughs> So we had a very happy uh, buyer to get that deal done, um, you know, against all odds, able to pull off some deals here at the finish line. Yeah. So, you know, I think the thing here is that, you know, we're able to get well beyond a 96% discount off of the list price in the right situations yes. here. And, you know, in a previous video, I said to people, look, it doesn't mean you have to go out and buy the next house you see. That's not what I'm telling you. Stay in the market, keep your eyes peeled, look for the right house. And let's go get it at the right price. Yep. And so we'd love to chat with you and talk strategy, figure out what that is for you. In the description, you can go schedule a call directly with Lee or I, or if you prefer to email us or text us, that info is available as well. We look forward to chatting with you. We've had a great time talking with other buyers that have reached out from our YouTube videos. So it's pretty cool. Absolutely. All right. This is, this is your baby here, Lee. Yeah. And um, we actually have a secret distribution list for this. If you want to get it weekly, 
uh, let us know. We're, Lee sends a really nice summary of what's going on in the market. Um, so just shoot us an email if this is a, something you'd like to see. Some of our top investors are like, yes, I want this weekly because yeah. it's so insightful. It's the only real-time metric right. of its type that I've seen. So I will let you cover it. Yeah, so basically the idea is we're trying to um, reflect current market data. It's a simple fraction. How many listings came to the market in a week divided by the number of pending sales in that week? And for the first time, David, in uh, quite some time, we're under 100%. Wow. So what does I, that mean? Basically, you can go through the numbers, bottom yeah, this, line. This is shocking. Can you confirm yeah. that you triple confirm the numbers? Because this is shocking. Yes, All I right. did. You did. All right, good. Okay. So here's what we got. We got the 100% line is what we're looking at. And so if, an, if it's above that, that means we have more listings coming online that are selling. And that has been the story going all the way back to May. We've right. had more listings. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, this month, whew, we're down to 61%. Huge drop from what we've been seeing. And uh, we will see if this is an anomaly, just in a weird week where not much was listed and a bunch of people went under contract, including a couple of our clients taking advantage of Parties coming together. I think what you have in earlier here is that sellers still want the re yes. unreasonable price yes. and buyers all of a sudden think they can get it down here. Right. And then what starts to happen over time is the parties start to come together. Yeah. And we're starting to hit, this is the best place you can be in a market is where everybody has reasonable expectations right. and deals just start happening. Yeah. And so maybe we're hitting that point. Well, one of the things one of the things to keep in mind here is the relatively low number of um, listings hitting the market. I believe it was seventy, mm -hmm. and then the number of pending sales just over a hundred, one hundred and fourteen. So it's easy to swing these numbers quite a bit. The main takeaway is this: nobody lists their home on Thanksgiving week. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but from a broader perspective, what it's basically showing us is sound fundamentals. If that number was continuing to go up through the holidays, showing a glut of inventory, we'd be singing a different song. But to me, this is a beautiful year-end affirmation of what we've been saying all year long. I love this statistic, and um, I continue to rely on it for our forecasting going forward. I mean, another thing here, Lee, is that you know, if only 70 properties are hitting the market, I mean, there are sellers out there that are willing to sell. Yes. They're just not on the MLS. And so there's a lot more off-market deals happening and there's benefits to sellers of doing this. One, they don't risk racking up days on market, right. which you have the, the buyers going, oh, what's wrong with the property? It's yeah. been on the market for a hundred days, right? Yeah. So they don't risk that. There's also, they don't have like the market really telling them what it's worth. So potentially they could get a little bit more. So something they're like toying with that. Um, of course, it's advantageous for buyers because nobody else knows of it. Hopefully, the buyer's the one. Well, it depends who we're representing. Whoever we're representing, we want them to be the one getting the better end of the deal. Right. But you know, when we're representing the seller, it's like we're using that to our advantage off market to say, look, nobody else has seen this, Mr. Buyer. And for the buyers, we're saying, hey, look, we're going to go and try to get a better deal on this because you're the only buyer that actually has a chance to see this. If they Generally, if you want the highest price, you would go to the market and let the most buyers see it. But it's all strategy. Sometimes we do that with sellers for specific reasons. And when you're on the buy side, we want to take advantage of trying to get a better deal with these off-market deals. But you just have more options. To me, it falls under a broader category that I like to refer to as the HGTV effect, where by golly, America's pastime is real estate and darn near everybody with a TV set and the internet is a real estate expert. Yeah. The idea that um, days on market going up are bad is much more understood by consumers now than it was 15 years ago. And so there's a lot of folks that um, don't want that stigma of uh, days on market piling up, but they want to sell. And so because we are connected in various networks throughout our associations with other colleagues, um, we have access to some listings that are quite attractive. And if you're currently looking um, as a buyer, we would like to be able to show you some of those properties that you're not going to find anywhere else. Yeah, and at all price points, but especially as you work up yes. into the luxury price points, multi-million dollar homes, there's more of that happening off market. Some of those sellers, they want to be more private. Right. Oftentimes there's a tax advantage right. because they don't want text the county to know what the property sold for. So as a buyer, if you get it off market, oftentimes your taxes, because these 
properties have sold off market multiple times, the property taxes are artificially low, making your costs lower. So there's there are some advantages, and um, we have at least one off market deal we just put under contract right now, and it wasn't listed anywhere. Um, so that's pretty exciting for that buyer. He feels like he, he's getting a great home at a solid price, so we're excited for him. And you know, every month we're doing off market deals. Um, it's just become like. 40% of the deals we do. Yeah, no, there's um, a lot to it. And, um, you know, volatility in the market creates opportunity. The holidays add in a, an extra dimension of emotional impact and all kinds of year end pressure. It's a great time to be a buyer right now. Mm -hmm. Now, what we started doing a couple months ago is we started talking about what's happening in the metro area. Now, most real estate experts are talking about the whole metro area, but what we decided to do was break it out. And we just talked about the city limits. Let's talk about outside the city limits as a separate entity. And that way we're not mingling the two numbers together. And so this is just totally separate. So what we have going on is over five, nearly six months of inventory outside the city limits, 7,200 homes. So you can see there's just more homes available outside the city. We had what, 2,200 yeah. in Austin right. and 7,200 outside of Austin. So we're looking at a similar pattern of um, the market slowing down in terms of sales per month, uh, down about 41% year over year, 27% month to month. Um, yeah, it's not uh, anything shocking or out of the uh, pattern that we've been seeing. So to me, it's just uh, more of the same. Mm -hmm. The average price uh, up year over year still outside the city limits. Barely hanging on. Yeah, and I think these... Interesting, the dynamic of these two different stats. So first you have the number of sales aren't down as much as in the city, right? So you have 40% versus Austin saw 54% decline year over year in the number of transactions. Right. But pricing is holding up better within the city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever people have asked me about, oh, where should I invest? I always say, like, people know Austin. Austin's the place to invest. Mm -hmm. It's going to hold its value in downturns. And we're seeing that despite there being way fewer transactions, the price is holding up better than outside the city limits. Of course, it's more affordable outside the city limits, which could be one reason why more transactions are happening. Yeah. And then the number of days it's taking to sell, well, the same 130%. Yeah. So again, nothing shocking um, in terms of the pattern that we're seeing. It's all in alignment with um, you know the forecast that we've been making. And uh, your point about basically premium real estate. So if we consider the city limits, you know, closer to the central core being a, a premium location, the demand is always going to be stronger to your thesis. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't fantastic opportunities in the outlying area, just depends on your strategy, your lifestyle preferences, um, you know, a lot of different ways to play the hand. Yeah. There's lots, you know, where you're commuting to work and right. you have kids, school districts, all these things play a factor, yeah. right? So when you say lifestyle preferences, all the, that is encompassing. Right. So the number of new listings are down as well to 8% year over year, 18% month over month. So again, same thing is happening within the city. People are like, well, my house is worth less. I don't want to sell it then. I'm just going to wait. Yeah. And that's a rational way to think about it. So the, the only part I would say that they could maybe have, depending on their situation, be thinking about it a little bit better, is potentially if they're also going to be buying. Because if they are if they could potentially put themselves in a situation where they're giving, giving up a 10% discount on the sale of their existing home, let's say that's at 500000 mm -hmm. but they're getting into a million-dollar home and getting a 20% right. discount, that, that trade-up is going to be to their advantage. So I think people are really quick to just say, well, I'm not selling because my house is worth less. Versus talking about the alternative and having the right alternative in mind and being able to uh, look at the whole picture. And if you want help with that, go to schedule a call with us. We're happy to walk you through this and see if it makes sense. It might be that, you know what, it doesn't make sense. Yes. And, and like we want to tell you exactly the right thing for you. Um, you know, we, we get as much joy out of telling somebody to not buy or not sell, not transact <clears throat> because it's the right thing for them than to just you know tell them to buy or sell because we're going to make something. That's not our motive here. Had that conversation yesterday. Um, met with a seller. Their listing just expired, and they were chasing the market down, and they're at a price right now. Well, gosh, why didn't it sell? Um, property's been stigmatized at this point. So take the holidays off. Enjoy your time. Enjoy your family. Enjoy life. 
and then get back into the market if you can, you know, if you have that discretionary flexibility in the spring. As now, a, now as a seller. Not, as a seller. As a seller, now is not the time to just sell on a whim. But to your point, if there's a back-end purchase, now is the time to do that. Um, anyway, I think you made the point eloquently. To wrap up, Make sure that whatever you're seeing in the news, that you take it with a grain of salt. Don't just read the headline. Read the article. See what's in there uh, about everything. And just know the three key takeaways we talked about today. One, high interest rates, fear. Those are good indicators of that it's a time to buy. Two, Austin fundamentals. Remember, Austin is not acting and performing the way that the entire country is. We're one of the strongest markets in the country, if not in the world. Right. And three, there's a lot of stuff happening off market. So make sure you get in contact with a real estate team like us. You can reach out to us that has access to those things and we can help guide you through getting the best deal if you're a buyer and if you're a seller, coming up with the right strategy to make it happen. So don't hesitate to reach out. Again, there's a link below. Shoot us an email, whatever's best for you. And we look forward to talking with you. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you on the next video. Thanks everybody.